Hello and welcome to another of my moustache musings. Today I'm going to talk about education. <clears throat> the dangers of focusing on academic qualifications, academic excellence, and what I think uh, a student should have to equip him or her for life. I speak from the experience of a teacher with over 30 years of experience and I've uh, taught many, many students. I've seen them grow from children to adults to parents and I've seen some of them who've successful, some who maybe didn't do as well in life as expected but I will tell you their stories but before I do before I do could you help me by clicking the thumbs up sign if you like my musings my moustache musings and uh, if you don't agree I'd love to hear your comments so just drop me a comment and I'll try to answer them or address them in the, another of my musings. <clears throat> okay, on with the show. I want to start by telling you about a reunion that I had with uh, my old school chums from Bukit Bintang Boys School in PJ. Good evening. Hello. The dog is uh, very good. Huh? No need to put chain. Huh? <laughs> okay, anyway. Uh, and uh, we left school in 1985. So we met maybe around 10 years ago for our first reunion and a lot of us turned up, a lot of happy faces at the reunion, you know, meeting up with old friends and of course there was uh, a lot of memories that were shared and uh, a lot of catching up. Uh, to do. But what I noticed was, oh, before I tell you what I noticed, our Bukit Bintang, Bukit Bintang Boys School, we had a uh, stream, class streaming. So, out of the many form, uh, uh, many students from my batch, <clears throat> there were about, if I'm not mistaken, five classes. Three in the science stream, and then there, was, uh, there were two from the art stream. And in the science stream, there was one class where the school decided to put all the best students in my batch uh, in that one class. So they said that <clears throat> if you really wanted to excel and do well in your exams, so you guys should try and get into that class because everybody is uh, really smart, really hardworking. And you know, probably based on the old saying, iron sharpens iron, metal sharpens metal. And uh, this is not a bad idea. This is actually quite a good idea. So, we had that uh, all the best students in my batch were put into one class. Well, du during the reunion, about 10 years ago, so we are, we are probably in our 40s now, and we are all meeting up, and I noticed that 
Not everybody from the best class were successful in their career, in their life. I dare say that not even half of them are millionaires. Of course, you know, nobody <clears throat> would outrightly declare themselves a millionaire, but if you judge uh, their financial success by the car that they drove and uh, the watches that they wore and the brand of clothes that they were wearing, uh, you could probably guess that uh, they are financially well off. <clears throat> So only a handful from the best class fell into that category. Now on the other hand, those fellas from the average class, there were also a handful of people who <laughs> fell in that same successful financial, financially successful category as well. And uh, that, 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 there should, shouldn't be any surprises there because sure, you know, there will be some people who will just make it in life. But you would think that there will be more people from the best class than there are from the other classes, right? Well, surprisingly, no. Surprisingly, the ones who had, who had the flashy cars came from the non-best class. So I'm going to tell you that from here you can, you can, you can conclude that education can bring you so far in life your academic uh, life, if you excel in it, it can only bring you so far in life. But if you want to be super rich, filthy rich, education is not what you need. Right now, the richest man in the world is Jeff Bezos. And people are now talking about how he used to work in McDonald's. Jeff wasn't a very big time uh, corporate guy. He wasn't a, he was almost like a average guy who kind of saw an opportunity and uh, over the many, many years, grew it and grew it and grew it, changed this business model to make him the multi-billionaire that he is today. Uh, you can also talk about Bill Gates, who also is not very academically, uh, uh, how do you say? He's not an academic academician. Uh, the owner of Facebook, what's his name now? Zuckerberg, Mark Zuckerberg. He also isn't isn't the top student in his class. Sure, they a lot of them went to good universities, but education is not the thing that earned them their money, their big bucks. Are there people who got rich from uh, their uh, education, their degree, their doctorate? Yeah, sure, there are. But by and far, if you really want to earn the big bucks, you really have to start some sort of business. And it very seldom has anything to do with your academic qualification. 
So, why are we sending our children into universities and making them suffer through an education system that I've just shown you does not give them the best chance of earning, of becoming multi-millionaires. You want to become a multi-millionaire? You got to have some sort of bis business. I think that a student should not only be educated during their education year, which is up until the age of 24. A lot of people will probably finish their degree at the age of 23, 24. I think that it is very important that every student not only has a balanced academic life, but also include extracurricular activities into their uh, education life. And I feel very strongly that it is the non-education uh, things that you do in college that will ultimately propel you to financial greatness. Now, I'm, I'm not saying that education is not important. Hi, ah, evening. Education is important. We know that you cannot have a stupid person be successful in life. I, I mean, successful financially. You, it's just impossible. You, if you look around uh, all the Forbes list of multi-billionaires and millionaires, <clears throat> you can see that all these people are educated to a certain extent. Now, being educated and having your education earn you your millions is, are two different things, okay? So, I want to talk about what else a student has to do in order to be a well-rounded person. So, I feel that besides academically academic excellence i think students should also be involved in other um, curricular activities for instance you could do robotics which is not part of your uh, education system programming music uh, charity work I think these, these are really interesting things that students should get involved in. <clears throat> now, a few years ago, a few years ago, private schools started to mushroom because a lot of parents were willing to pay to send their children to private schools. So private schools just mushroom in KL and Penang and Malacca. It's uh, ridiculous, I thought. Now, I want to say that our Malaysian education system is 
not the best in the world, but as a teacher and as someone who's been teaching the Malaysian syllabus for many, many years, I can see that they are constantly changing their syllabus and uh, updating it with new things that students should know. So our education, education system has not stagnated. Granted, it's behind many uh, first world countries, but we are not very far behind. I teach science. One of my subjects that I teach is science. And there used to be a time when I would stand in front of the class and try and explain science scientific concept to my students and these are primary school students so it's not very difficult to explain things like uh, heat can expand matter and there are three states of matter so these are all stuff that you can find in your kitchen you know you can find ice in your kitchen you can find water in your kitchen and if you heat up the water you can actually make steam for the kids uh, to see so it's not, it's not very difficult. But then it dawned upon me after the introduction of YouTube and YouTube got really popular. It dawned on, uh, upon me that I could actually supplement my teaching with videos. And these are videos that are created by YouTubers, content creators. And I was surprised that Countries like India, New Zealand, Australia, England, they were teaching the same things that was found in our local syllabus. Now, if you say our local syllabus is half past six, then how come they are also teaching the same things in England and New Zealand and India? So obviously, there are people in our ministry who are looking at other education ministries to see where they are at to make sure that our education system isn't too far behind. So I want to tell you that there are lots of changes and uh, there is a big challenge for teachers who used to prepare lessons for this year and then thinking it's okay, we just prepare it this year and then we don't have to prepare it, we don't have to re-prepare it for the next 10 years because education system doesn't change. Well, sometimes you prepare it this year and in two years time, it's already more or less obsolete. you got to re-prepare it again. Re-prepare, re, re-prepare your lessons and examples and charts and videos and pictures or update them with extra things, remove uh, some some parts of the, the lesson which used to be there but now no more. So you just you just gotta you just gotta uh, update yourself as a teacher. So our, our, our education, Malaysian education, the local syllabus is not too bad. But still parents, many, many parents uh, are willing to pay extra money to send their children to private schools. Now, when I was uh, trying to register Paprika for a primary school, we were told that on the day she is born and she gets her birth certificate, you should quickly take that birth birth certificate and go and apply to go to that local. It's a local Chinese school, by the way. You have to go and apply a place for her already. And uh, when uh, we were talking about it, when we were asking, hey, how do you apply for <laughs> for uh, you know to to go into that? to a certain school and then they, when they found out that Paprika was already three years old, four years old, they said, too late already lah. No, don't bother to apply lah. It's too late already. 
Oh, horror, forest. Really, ah? Yeah. People, ah, apply their children, ah, for Chinese school, ah. On the day they get their birth certificate, ah. If not, ah, no place really, lah. Your daughter is already four years old. No hope, lah. So, what to do? We quickly tried, lah. Got all the forms and whatnot. Went to the... Went to the... Um, school office and asked for a form so that we could register paprika and then we I, I, I didn't go but Swan, Swan went but and she got the impression that uh, she wasn't supposed to uh, apply, apply for the school like like um, as though that you can't apply anymore you know <clears throat> and then we were wondering yeah must be true really it's uh, too late, too late to apply for the Chinese school. But we talked to some um, of Paprika's kindergarten parents and um, uh, they were also trying to apply. So we, we weren't the only ones who haven't registered our child with the Chinese school. And uh, so there was one parent who kind of knew one of the teachers so the teacher would help us to uh, apply and uh, the teacher said wait until they are five years old then then we'll apply because the following year paprika will be six and <clears throat> you go to school when you're seven months so that will be too late already so it's either this year next year is the last chance we applied uh, at age when paprika was five years old and uh, through the, the teacher uh, her registration was accepted uh, I mean received lah. last time we went we wanted to hand in the reg registration we were told <coughs> cannot so gave us the impression that no more place ready for paprika but uh, through this uh, teacher so we got a, we got special uh, privilege lah. Something like that. So she went to school. Um, she went to Standard 1. And there was like an orientation. Uh, and you know, the students were told where the canteen was, what to do when you hear this music and that bell and who's your teacher and where's your class and what, what you can do, what you cannot do in school. And uh, I happened to meet the headmaster. And uh, I asked, uh, I told the headmaster, I said, oh, you know, we are really glad to be in your school. Thanks for accept, accept, accepting our daughter. And uh, uh, so I told him, we, we, we tried to apply when she was four, but we were told that we should have applied when she was born. <laughs> and the headmaster said, oh, no, no. Um, no, 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 there are plenty of... of uh, space in, in our school for students to to join our school because a lot of our students have gone to private schools wait hold the phone man I thought Chinese schools are where parents want to send their kids and here you're telling me that even Chinese school parents are pulling their children out of Chinese schools and sending them to private schools. That is the level of distrust parents have with our local education system. Well, as a teacher, I have um, met many students. <clears throat> of all the parents, I asked, why did you take your child and put them into uh, private school only one parent gave me the correct answer in my opinion okay every parent told me private schools got better education their syllabus is world class in my opinion that's the wrong answer only one parent 
told me the correct answer. And this parent happened to be my uncle. His children, he lives in Johor. And every day, he has to send his children to a private school in, wait for it, Singapore. So these kids wake up at 5 in the morning, they change and get ready in their car and then they have a short nap while they cross the border into Singapore to go to school. And in the afternoon, they are fetched home from Singapore and they have to cross the border again. And I asked, I was uh, wondering, you know, must be so difficult for the kids to do this kind of uh, education life. So when I asked my uncle, why, did, why are you doing this for? And he said, <laughs> He said, get ready for this, they can make good networking connections. He is the only, he was the only guy who understood the power of mixing with rich kids. He wanted his kids to mix with other rich kids to build networking and connection, connections. Now, if you want to send your kids to private schools, I think that that, that is the main reason. That should be the main reason. Interestingly enough, that was also the same reason why Jolo, Jolo's father sent Jolo to prestigious private schools all the way into college and Jolo to his credit he used his time mixing with rich kids making connections all the way to royal families to the prime minister and ultimately to billions and billions of dollars through the one MDB fund and if you've read uh, billion dollar whale, you will know that 1MDB was not the only fund that Jolo uh, fleeced or Jolo misused. He had, before that, also uh, had access to other funds. But 1MDB was the mother of all funds, lah, so to speak, lah, in, uh, for Jolo. Lah. Now, if you think that education is very important, it's, 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 it's super important, well, you're right. It's, I wouldn't downplay uh, education. If your child is a student who usually gets 90 for a certain subject, and if it dips to, let's say, 70, something has gone wrong and you should investigate and find out why his marks have failed, uh, has dipped in that particular subject that he's usually good at. But I think that if you focus too much on academic excellence, I think it's useless for every student, every child. I think it's useless. Some children are really good at education and some are not. I think that most of us fall in the not. I think that if most of Malaysian students can get 70, around 70 marks for their exams per subject, I think that should be, that should be okay. I think you can consider yourself a good student. 60 or so, I think, should be should be okay because 
if you supplement your education life with other things like football and uh, chess and uh, debating society, I think these things will also end up benefiting you in life. I'm going to tell you the story of uh, a friend of mine, same batch uh, from my Bukit Bintang Boys School. He, when we met him, he drove a Nissan GTR. And we all know it was his GTR because when he arrived at one of the reunions, and that was the first reunion that he had uh, attended. We had, we had several before, but uh, we had lost contact with him. And then somebody uh, got in touch with him and uh, invited him for the following reunion. And when he arrived at the reunion, it was held at, uh, at one of our classmates' uh, home. He arrived in his GTR, and we all know that he was in GTR because he revved the car so so loudly. We could not help but notice his his sports car. And uh, over time, we I met up with him, and uh, he drives big cars. And I think I would wouldn't be wrong in considering him a millionaire. So one day while I was in the car with him, we were going somewhere and uh, I asked him for his, uh, his story. Now he didn't come from the best class. In fact, I hardly noticed him in school. I, when I saw him, I kind of recognized him like, like he, he, he was a familiar face, but that was about it. I, I, I didn't know much about him. And then he, he told me that he came from a not well-to-do family. Uh, he, in his uh, primary school exam, his parents had promised to buy him a bicycle if he did well. And he did do well in his primary school exam, but he never got his bicycle. And he never, and he always complained that if he had, if he had received that bicycle when he in, in primary school, then he would have learned to ride a bicycle. But because his parents were too poor to fulfill that promise, so he never learned to ride a bicycle. But here he is, you know, driving several big cars. He and uh, yeah, he, he's, I would say he's well off, lah. So I asked him for his uh, his story. I so I know that he came from a, a not well-to-do family. So how did he make his money? He said, "Oh, after form five, I went to work in." Uh, nightclub. So I was uh, surprised. I, I, I said, oh, you are also a DJ because one of the other boys uh, also uh, uh, got, got a job as a DJ after school. He said, no, no, I was a bouncer. I was like, wait, what? You were the bouncer? He said, yeah. I'm thinking, wait, how, how, can, how is this possible? You are a classy guy now and you used to be a bouncer and he said you think about it lah Pepper I'm Indian big size cannot study what other job is there for me bouncer lah <laughs> so he, his first job after SPM was being a bouncer at a club in PJ <laughs> he, he managed to study law so he became a lawyer but for many many years he he didn't earn much he said in fact he did a lot of uh, side jobs to earn money uh, besides his uh, law practice being a lawyer he said they didn't earn him much money so he did a lot of other side uh, work until he cracked one big case a case which was 
uh, deemed impossible and he managed to win it for his client. And he said, after that case, things started to happen for him. He, he said that uh, lots of uh, clients would come and look for him when they needed someone to win impossible cases. Now, if you want to say that this friend of mine is an educated guy, I would say yes, he's educated, but is he a, an academician? The answer is definitely no. How many times have I read messages from him or messages that he's typed in our group chat and he still, until today, spells the word video wrong. He spells it V-E-D-I-O. Really, as how you pronounce it, video. <laughs> but we don't care. I mean, <laughs> spell it wrong, spell it wrong. Lah. As long as we understand what you're trying to say, okay. Lah. <laughs> we don't need to correct people when they spell things wrongly. So, but being, being a teacher myself, of course, I spot these mistakes. <laughs> Man, if he's watching, if he's watching this video, I think I'm gonna get enough from him. <laughs> but here's here's the point I want to make. The point I'm trying to make is, you really don't have to be an academician and get hundred for your exams in your school life in order for you to be rich and be a, a multi-millionaire. Really, you 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 don't. Now here's the other thing that I observed in our reunion. Not one person in our batch made his money through his degree. Meaning that if you are an accountant, you worked as an, you work as an accountant and you became a multi-millionaire. Or an engineer and you work as an engineer. So you your career is engineering. So you became a multi-millionaire. I cannot think of anyone who did that in my batch and I can't even think of anyone who... I cannot think of many people who actually became super rich through their career. So again, your academic qualifications can only bring you so far in life but if you really want to hit pay dirt the big bucks, you want to be Jeff Bezos, you want to be the guy uh, who does something interesting like uh, Steve Jobs and what's the guy who owns Tesla and SpaceX. If you want to be like them, it is not your paper degree that's going to help you, that's going to uh, help you achieve it. it your paper degree is definitely important because it shows that you are a smart guy. You're a brilliant guy. You can understand difficult things. If I had to build rockets, I definitely would be looking for engineers who can solve problems and not my friend, the lawyer. If I had to give parents advice, I would advise them to think very carefully about their children's education and what their children are not receiving in school. To give you an example, my children have joined me in my orchestra and uh, before the pandemic happened and we had to cancel orchestral practices, weekly orchestral practices, every week, once a week, my children and I would go and attend orchestral practices. I feel that everybody should learn some sort of musical instrument 
doesn't matter what. Could be a easy one to learn or a very difficult one to learn. It doesn't matter. As long as you learn it. You don't even have to play it well. You don't have to uh, sit for exams and get A's uh, for your musical instrument. But you should be able to, at the very least, be able to toot a tune. I think that that is more in, more important. I think that uh, so for my children during the school holidays, we try not to do too many too many school too much school work or school related things. Uh, of course, if you leave your children to do whatever they want to do, every day is going to be games day. So I set different things for them to do every day. You wake up, you tell them go get your breakfast. Today is storybook day. So no TV, no computers, no devices. Just get a storybook to read. And I know that my son really hates uh, reading. So I allow him to read comics. And uh, I've got lots of comics that were donated to me by a friend of mine. He had a whole stash of Doraemon uh, comics and uh, so I, I get I get Saffron to just, yeah, I told him you, if you want to read uh, the comics, go ahead, you can read them, but uh, he prefers to read comics in English. So I try to push him to read uh, comics in Bahasa so that he can also brush up on his Bahasa. Then there's uh, baking day. Before uh, the pandemic came around, uh, we used to have weekends where the kids would plan and cook something for the entire family, including their grandparents. So it could be burgers, it could be pizza, it could be, could be anything. So I tell them, go look up the recipe, and let's try it. So maybe that, that day was cake baking day or pizza day, uh, rumly burger day and I'll try to uh, help them along. Um, I, I remember we actually, I actually found the A's suppliers for rumly burger stalls and uh, this, this shop had everything that you that you needed if you had a uh, burger stall they had buns and ketchup and uh, patties and all sorts of things you know those uh, I, I, I think I don't need to give you any more examples and we I went with the kids and we went nuts we, we bought for that one meal, we bought 80 ringgit worth of raw materials for that one meal. And you know that family burger is really cheap. There are only six of us to cook for. And yet, we spent 80 over ringgit <laughs> buying raw materials that day. We, we basically just went nuts. Uh. I think that these are the things that would help to round children, students, into um, useful human beings in, in, in the future. <clears throat> I have a friend named Edward and uh, he's in his uh, 60s if I'm not mistaken now, maybe older. He told me about his uh, reunion and he said that, oh wait, i got to Wow, I just caught it in time. The, there's a limit to my videos. <clears throat> anyway, Edward was telling me that in his uh, school reunion, there's one guy whom, who never turns up for the reunions and he was the, the top student in his batch. But he would never turn up for the reunions. It seems that he... Uh, he was so sure that he would be the most successful person in the batch. But during one of the economic downturns, 
he got retrenched and uh, he uh, never recovered from from uh, that retrenchment so they feel that for fear of embarrassment he just doesn't turn up for the reunions which is kind of sad but it proves my point that your academic life really has very little um, to contribute to your success as a human being, as a person. Okay, I've talked about being multi-millionaires, but you know what? I think that in life, not everybody can be a multi-millionaire. Uh, there are lots of things that need to fall into place before you can actually be a multi-millionaire because if, uh, if, if it was so easy, I think everybody would be a multi-millionaire. But it's not that simple, it's not that easy. I think it's more important that people come out of college and they kind of know how to cari makan. And we all have different levels that we think that we need in life. And I think that it's better that um, a young a young man or and young lady to should know what levels to expect, what levels to, uh, they should aim for. Um, then to say, I want to be a millionaire. Because I think that it's more important to be happy and to be, uh, what do you call it? To be satisfied with, with what you have in life or what you can obtain in life. Now you can be the smartest person in the world and you can be the most hardworking person you know everything that there is on how to generate money but let's say you happen to be in a very poor country there are no banks in that country there's no commerce there's no trade there's no international trade there's very little electricity you have to everybody has their own generator at home I really don't see how you can achieve your dream of being a millionaire. So, but I think that if you are clever, you can decide on what could make you happy in life and be satisfied and be contented uh, even though you live in those kinds of conditions, what to do. Yeah. It's not that you want to live in those conditions, but that particular country is such that <clears throat> you're trapped in it. So a clever person would just realize not to pursue uh, riches, but instead um, maybe need to apply their understanding and learn how to live in that kinds of that kind of uh, condition lah. And I think that is that's what's important. I think that a lot of students come out from universities and they are surprised when there's no job for them in the field that they studied in and they feel so wasted <clears throat> and useless and cheated when actually they don't realize that they can use that degree and the time that they had uh, spent in university to the knowledge, whatever knowledge that they had gained in university to apply for a different kind of job, one that is readily available. When I received my doctorate, in theology, of course, I was very 
I was really happy. But I soon found that a doctorate in divinity is totally useless in the in our in our society. It contributes nothing. But while I was thinking about it and being uh, sad over all that time and amount of energy that I had devoted to pursuing my doctorate, I realized one thing. I realized that I was a good student and my that piece of certification proves that I can study and I can learn. And even though it's something difficult, I'm able to understand it. And that was my biggest, biggest takeaway from my doctorate in divinity. So every time I um, get a new job in a new industry, maybe it's an, an industry that I've never been in before. So I always tell myself, hey, if you can study, Theology, this thing should be quite easy. La. Come on, you can also do this as well. So, I apply myself with the full knowledge that I'm able to study and to learn new things and then apply what I've learned. If you're children uh, play sports, I would encourage you to let them continue playing sports and uh, not focus so much on their uh, academic um, pursuits. Because I can tell you for a fact that when your children come out to work and go for job interviews, people like me who used to interview and select candidates to work in our companies, we, I very often look at the extracurricular activities. After a while, if you have looked through hundreds and hundreds of applicants, and you know, it's so easy to get hundreds of applications for one job through websites like Job Street and and all these monster.com I think it's called or, or monsterjobs.com or something like that and you know everybody applies through all these uh, job recruitment agencies and companies after a while you you will notice that all the degrees are the same social science and what mass comm the names of the, of the universities are the only things that are different. But, but the degrees are all the same. And then when you look at what they learned, they are all the same as well. So what's going to set this candidate apart? I have to look elsewhere. I have to look at their extracurricular activities. If I'm looking for a salesman, I'm looking for someone who is a bit outgoing, and not an introvert, need someone who you know can carry himself well, so I'll look for a sportsman. Someone who's been in uh, some sports house, who was a captain of the volleyball team, or he represented his school in badminton or something, because salesmen they earn their money through commissions. No commission no pay. So they really need to know, but they really need to get out there and make a sale. They don't make the sale, there's no commission, then there's no salary. These are the people who need to know what it feels like to lose and to win. And what better person understands this feeling than a sportsman who wins and loses. So. If you were to take uh, an, an ordinary person who has never uh, done this kind of uh, has never been in this kind of environment where they win and lose, 
on a regular basis. I can tell you, on the day they get turned down for a big sale, it they, it might send them into depression, and they'll think, "What a waste of time! This is the rubbish job." But you don't realize that in sales, these these kinds of things happen. You you go in and pitch for a project, and then sometimes you get it, and sometimes you don't. But you know, a sportsman who's been playing sports in school, they know that feeling. They know what it's like to lose, and therefore, I feel that they can manage their feelings、uh, when they lose. So it doesn't affect them as much. What we need is someone who can just say, "Okay, we lost, but let's look for let's let's look forward to the next game." I think that that is that is more useful for a salesman. If I'm looking for an accountant, I'm looking for someone who's quiet, who's who is able to work alone. So I'll look at your extra curricular curricular activities. So if your extra curricular activities include things like、uh, sportsmen, you're probably wrong for the job. If your extra curricular activity says things like, uh, uh, what do you call, some vigorous activity, then I think you are not probably not suitable to be a good accountant. I would need someone who states that they are in the nature club or in the chess club. You know. Chess club, chess—the game where you can look at one board and stare at it for an hour, two hours, <laughs> without getting bored. This is what I would look for in an accountant, lah. Huh? Right? Not. <laughs> so that's why I say that all students. Should have some sort of extra curricular activity, and I hope that you agree with me. If you are a parent like me, it's always never too late to、uh, to set your children on this、uh, path where they supplement their academic life with extra curricular activities. And it could be anything. I kind of know what my children like, so I steer them towards that. My children do not like chess, so I I never push them to play chess.、Um, one of them likes music. Another one likes has started to sew and do some craft work. So I just let them continue and、um, uh, try and encourage them. To do that, and I always tell them as well: don't neglect your uh, academic, um, your studies. You know, try and get 90 if you can. But I do know that there are certain subjects which they just can't score high marks. So I tell them, 70 is okay, lah. That one, you know. But it's not because they are lazy. If you are lazy, you know, lazy. That, that that that's no excuse to get 70 marks. If you if you are a 90 marks person, student, then you should get 90 marks. You should try and aim for that. But if you are a 70 marks、uh, student, then okay, I will accept you at your 70 marks. If you say you want to get better, you get more marks. You want to get 90, then I will help you. I will find a tuition teacher for you. I will send you for extra classes. Or help you lah, because you have that desire to want to improve yourself. But I think seventy is very decent. I think seventy is very good.、Uh, but it, but it really depends on the student. It really depends on the child. I've seen、uh, as a teacher, I've seen parents who get upset and they stop their. Um, sending their children to me because their children did not get a certain 
uh, mark in in their exam. It's kind of sad, but that's the choice that they uh, they make lah. I don't advise the parents out outright, of course. I mean, that's not my place. I just this is probably probably the first time I'm talking about it. Well, the moustache compels me to tell you. Okay lah, I think I've talked way more than I should. If if uh, maybe we'll revisit this topic again sometime. So this is the end of my talk. I hope you enjoyed it. If you do, please give me a thumbs up on my video. Share it with your friends. Hopefully it will help them. And if you have things to add, I always welcome uh, criticisms and comments. So just put a comment in the comment section and I'll see you in the next musing.